so I would like to start. All right. I think we're good now. Thank you everyone for lasting this long in the conference and hopefully we have some attention left for the last talk. So, and thanks for the generous introduction and also before I get started, I'd sincerely like to thank the Brain Foundation for sponsoring this research and giving me this seed funding to kind of get this research kick-started. So my name is Matt Lally. I'm an instructor working with Dr. Joseph Buxbaum at the Seaver Autism Center, where our goal is to connect the rare autism mutations, ultimately to common treatments. So our goal is to study multiple autism risk genes at once so that we can discover their shared, me their shared mechanisms. And we want to do this in an autism-relevant system, so we're using human neurons. So the outline of my talk today is that I'll introduce you all to the autism risk genes, their known functions, what we know about what pathways they might be affecting, and the relevant cell types to autism. And then I'll give you an overview of the technology that we're implementing to study multiple autism genes in the same setting. So this includes the induced pluripotent stem cells, our transcriptional profiling, and the CRISPR-Cas9 technology. And then I'll walk you through our preliminary results in which we've found some of the autism risk genes are affecting cell fate specification and neuron differentiation. And then I'll end with our future directions for the next year of our Brain Foundation grant. So autism risk gene discovery has really been remarkably successful. In 2014, a study from the Seaver Autism Center identified for the first time 22 genes with mutations with high confidence um, association to autism disease. In 2020, this number skyrocketed to 78, and just this year, the number has doubled again to 185 genes. So, on the right, I'm showing some of these autism genes that may be familiar to many of you and were presented in another excellent talk during this conference. So these are just showing the autism genes ranked by their position on the chromosome and our confidence that mutations in these genes really contribute to autism. So the tremendous success of autism gene discovery comes with a downside, which is that on the left, we have the tremendous polygenicity and all these hundreds of autism genes now discovered. And on the right is the neurobiologist, where we really need to understand the function of each of these autism genes and the impact of their mutations on human neurodevelopment. So autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder, and it's primarily genetic. So I'm glad to be coming back to this topic as we're wrapping up the conference. Although I've been inspired by much of the research that we've all heard over the past three days with regard to other aspects of autism. So on the left, again, is a high polygenicity, but we can also think about environmental factors. Basically on the right side, we're still bottlenecked in the lack of high throughput assays to understand all the risk variants that contribute to autism pathology. So this is just an introduction, again, to some of the autism, high-confidence autism risk genes. And the reason that I include this is because it nicely illustrates that we already know that they might have some shared functions, which are color-coded in this table. So this is also from the 2020 Satterstrom paper. So we see from this table two primary classes of autism risk genes that are colored by their function. In green, we have, a, we have a large set of autism risk genes that are playing a role at the synapse and roles in neuronal communication. And then in purple, we have another class of autism genes with putative functions in regulating gene expression. We also know a lot about the expression profile of these genes, so we need to know 
when and where these genes are expressed in human neurodevelopment. So what I'm plotting here is the cortical expression profile of each of these major classes of genes. And you can see slightly different patterns. So the purple gene expression regulator genes are highly expressed during prenatal development. And then the green genes involved in neuronal communications gradually increase over this period and then remain highly expressed. We also know a lot about the cell types that are implicated in autism, some of which I'm showing here, which include neural progenitor cells, neurons, and the supporting cells of the brain called glia. So to be able to study all of these autism risk genes, we need to be able to generate these cell types, but we largely lack access or direct access to the human brain, much less the developing human brain. So one workaround for this is using a technique called reprogramming into induced pluripotent stem cells. So in this method, we can take a person's blood or skin cells and then convert them to induced pluripotent stem cells. So induced pluripotent stem cells, or IPS, are defined by two main characteristics. The first characteristic is that they can, be un they can be grown in unlimited quantities because they renew indefinitely. And the second characteristic is that they can be converted into any cell type, including all of these autism-relevant neuronal and neural-related cells. So we're going to be using these human cellular models to recapitulate the autism-relevant cells in a dish. So going back to the autism risk genes and their gene expression profile, I want to point out that our human cellular model of neural progenitor cells really closely mimics this period of human neurodevelopment in a dish. So this early period of prenatal human development, which this is good for us because you can see both classes of the autism risk genes are expressed in this period. And just for the audience, I wanted to provide a picture of what we actually see in the microscope when we grow these cells. So we've now derived these neural progenitor cells from the IPS. This is what they look like under the microscope. And to verify their identity, we perform immunofluorescence for canonical neural progenitor markers. So in green, we have Nestin. In red, we have SOX2. So this is just to say that we've now created massive amounts of these human neural progenitor cells in a dish to study the autism risk genes. We also know a lot about human neurodevelopment and neurodevelopment in general. And a goal of this project is to see which of the autism risk genes may be converging onto certain cellular and molecular pathways. So some of the pathways that we know are occurring during this period are neurogenesis, which neurons are born, they proliferate, they migrate out to all areas of the brain. When they get to their destination, they extend these long and elaborately branched projections that we know is what a neuron looks like. Some of these cells are programmed to die, but the ones that remain end up starting to communicate to one another through synapses. So in addition to these known pathways and their timings, we can already begin to make hypotheses about which genes may be affecting which pathways. So these highly expressed gene expression regulators, because of their high expression at this period, we might hypothesize that they're affecting these pathways, whereas the neuronal communication genes, which peak later, may be playing a bigger role in some of these later pathways, which kind of makes sense because synaptogenesis and neuronal communication are essentially tightly connected. And here I'm just illustrating pathways and to define what I mean is just sets of genes or proteins that act together to perform a set of shared functions. So the key technological innovation of our proposal is to study many autism risk genes in the same setting so that we can directly compare the effects of each of these autism risk genes. 
And the way that we're able to do this is by using the breakthrough technology CRISPR-Cas9. So here I've illustrated an autism risk gene encoded in, the, in our genome at the level of the DNA. So we know that genes are transcribed into mRNA. So one of the properties of the autism risk gene mutations is that they largely act in a loss of function mechanism, which we can think of a decrease of the protein or a decrease of the mRNA level. Because they have this loss of function mechanism, we can then use CRISPR-Cas9 to reproduce this in a high throughput manner. So CRISPR-Cas9 technology is a protein called Cas9 that we can direct anywhere in the genome using a short piece of RNA called a guide RNA. So in this illustration, we're directing the Cas9 gene to block the transcription of an autism risk gene and thereby mimic this loss of function mutation. We call this CRISPR interference or CRISPR-I. The other important property of the Cas9 is that these guide RNAs are easily cloned into what we call a guide RNA library, where each of these colors represents us guiding the Cas9 to one of the different autism risk genes. But we can do this in really high throughput just by changing the guide RNA. So the idea is we'll block the transcription of the autism risk gene, knock down its level of RNA and the protein, and then study the downstream consequences, with our main output being the total gene expression profile in these autism-relevant cells. And from the gene expression profile, we'll infer the affected pathways. So for our Brain Foundation grant, we propose targeting 75 of the top highest confidence autism risk genes that have been identified in these tremendously successful genetic studies and will perturb their expression or induce loss of function in human iPS-derived neural progenitor cells. Then we can make a mixed set of differentiated cells from these and perform single cell RNA sequencing. So the two things I want to point out here are that each cell is given a different color. This is to represent that each cell is getting one and only one autism gene perturbation, but we're doing this for all 75 genes at the same time. And the way we can read out that is by this droplet-based method where cells are separated and we generate um, gene expression profiles for each of the single cells. So the experimental design looks something like this where we've done it in two biological replicates across many technical replicates using the 10x genomics platform. And then the rest of the results that I'll present are the bioinformatic interpretation of these single cell gene expression experiments. So moving on to the results now, I want to start with the most important result, which is that the CRISPR I worked. So we were trying to target multiple genes, 75 genes at once. And what I'm showing here in the plot is that we were able to successfully knock down the expression of all of the genes on this plot. The takeaway like characteristic of the plot is the blue diagonal. And to interpret that, we can um, use DDX3X as an example. So on this axis is the gene expression. And on the x-axis is the set of cells that received that guide RNA. So what the blue dot means, or the blue square here, is that DDX was reduced specifically in the set of cells that received the guide RNA targeting that gene. And that's true for each of the genes along the diagonal. So knowing that we've induced significant downregulation of each of these autism risk genes in the same experiment, we can then move on to the analysis. So the first analysis that we performed is, is clustering the cells to see what type of cell types we have in our population. So we're using human-induced pluripotent stem cells that can turn into any cells, and we've pushed them to neurons, but we still get a mix of cells, include, um, which is shown here. 
So then to annotate what these cells are, we look for the known marker genes in each of these three clusters. So what we found is that this cluster is a set of neural progenitor cells, and this cluster is more differentiated neurons. And this top cluster here represented a glial progenitor cell population. So we can take advantage of the mixed um, differentiation potential of human IPS to now generate the autism risk gene signatures in each of these three populations. But before generating signatures, we can leverage this heterogeneity to ask whether the knockdown of any of the autism risk genes is affecting the cell fate specification. So here we do exactly that. And to ask that question, we can simply plot the proportion of each uh, population of cells across each of our knockdown conditions. So the far left here is our non-targeting guide RNA. This is effectively the wild type, what we would get without a perturbation. And we see about 20% of the cells in a non-perturbed state end up becoming glia. But it, then if we move over to the far right here, we found a set of eight autism risk genes that when they're knocked down, they're pushing these neural progenitor cells to take on a gliogenic fate. So this is already a level of mechanism, a potential level of mechanistic convergence across the autism risk genes that they alter cell fate specification. And here is one example, if we zoom in in a little more detail about what I just described. So cells colored in blue are cells that have the gene MBD5 knocked down. You can clearly see that most of the blue cells end up in this top cluster that represents the glial progenitor cells, whereas the non-targeted control cells are red and end up all over the plot here. The next analysis we can do is to assess whether any of the autism risk genes are affecting neuron differentiation. And we do this using something called pseudotime analysis, where we're projecting cells along a trajectory based on transcriptional similarity. So here is a cool color moving to warm. And how do we interpret that? Again, we turn to known marker genes. So the top two genes here are markers of neural progenitor cells, and the bottom two genes here are markers of neuron differentiation. You can see that the neural progenitor cells are turning off and the neuron differentiation genes are going on. So this allows us to interpret our pseudotime as an axis of neuron differentiation. So the neural progenitor cells becoming neurons as you move along that trajectory. So this is important, again, because now it allows us to ask whether any of the autism risk gene knockdown is altering this critical process of neural differentiation. So here I'm showing the results of that analysis. I'm plotting just the average pseudotime across each of the knockdown conditions that have been normalized. Our non-targeting guide RNA did not alter pseudotime, falls pretty close to zero. Here I've normalized it to all the other conditions as opposed to normalizing to the non-targeting, but either way it doesn't change the analysis. The takeaway from this slide is that we found a set of three genes here that are significantly decreasing pseudotime, which I just showed you is a proxy for neuron differentiation. In other words, we may be able to interpret this decrease of pseudotime as these cells stop differentiating. Instead, they remain neural progenitor cells, so they may be caught like the cell cycle disrupted. And on the other end of this plot is another set of three genes with increased pseudotime score. So these may have an accelerated neural differentiation. So this type of analysis enables us to ask whether the autism risk genes are altering the timing of neural differentiation, which is one of the fundamental hypotheses of autism risk mechanisms. And I'm almost done, so bear with me for a few more slides. 
But I've shown you that we've used the single cell RNA sequencing to capture the gene expression profiles for each of the autism risk genes. I just wanted to show that a little more concretely here with an example. So this is a typical gene expression, differential gene expression plot called the volcano plot. This is an example of the SCN2A knockdown in the neural cells, the subset of the neural cells in our experiment. So genes on the left here are turned down. It's a good sanity check that we see the SCN2A gene itself turned down in this condition. And then another set of genes are turned on. So I've been simplistically representing that here, like these genes would be turned down and these genes would be turned on. So this is what we're talking about when I, or this is what I'm talking about when I say a gene expression signature. So I want to conclude by telling you the future direction of the next year of our brain foundation grant, which is to use these signatures for drug repurposing. So we want to be able to reverse these ASD risk gene signatures. But before even reversing it, we can already learn many um, potential points of convergence across the autism risk genes by clustering the risk genes by their signature. For example, these two autism risk genes would have the same signature. So unbiased clustering would say that those may have convergent downstream mechanisms. But in the next year, we want to use these signatures to match the gene expression patterns with existing drug signatures. So this has also been presented by others at the conference here. But you can look for the signatures of FDA-approved drugs. There's a collection now of these signatures that have been generated in iPS neurons. And the idea is that if a drug has the inverse pattern of your autism risk gene signature, then adding that drug onto your cells with that knockdown would then transcriptionally reverse that autism risk signature and rescue you back to a healthy transcriptional state. And this has been widely used in the cancer field, but totally underutilized in neurodevelopment. So we think it has broad potential to facilitate like drug repurposing in autism. So that's all I have. In summary, I've just given a quick rundown about the success of rare mutation discovery in autism and the pathways and cell types that we think may be involved and our plan to leverage these technologies to come up with therapeutics to improve the quality of life for those with autism. This is really enabled by new technologies that allow us to study multiple autism risk genes at the same time, which is important if you want to compare their effects in a uniform assay. And what we found is that many autism risk genes seem to affect cell fate specification, neural progenitor cell proliferation, and neuron differentiation. And their signatures and the convergent signatures may serve as targets for therapeutic intervention. And with that, again, I'd like to thank the Brain Foundation for not only inviting me today to present, but also for funding our work, and the Beatrice and Samuel Siever Foundation, and the NARSAD for their support too, my fantastic collaborators and mentors at Mount Sinai. And thank you all for your attention after three days of this conference.